Princess Diana was a fascinating figure, and she's remained that way even decades after her death, especially as new information has emerged about the People's Princess that nobody knew before. Here are a few of the biggest things that were revealed about Princess Diana after she died. Sitting in a London cafe one morning, longtime author and journalist Andrew Morton made a discovery that would change his life and the world forever. In his sensational 1992 book, Diana, Her True Story, in her own words, Morton detailed the first time he heard Diana's, quote, unmistakable voice on an audio recording that had been placed in his possession. It painted a vastly different portrait of the princess than anyone in the public to that time understood. He wrote of his discovery, it was like being transported into a parallel universe, the princess talking about her unhappiness, her sense of betrayal, her suicide attempts, and two things I had never previously heard of, bulimia nervosa, an eating disorder, and a woman called Camilla. Diana had recorded these tapes with voice coach Peter Settelin as a form of therapy. According to a 2017 article in The Telegraph, the vocal coach sold Diana's tapes to Britain's Channel 4 after her death, much to the dismay of Diana's family, who claimed ownership of the tapes. There's just nobody to, to, to uh, physically scream at or someone put their arms around me, just listen. Diana's personal tapes were first discovered when the former royal butler to Diana, Paul Burrell, was found to have been hoarding them after a 2001 police raid of his home. The discovery caused great controversy. Diana's former butler was reportedly found to be holding on to more than just Diana's private tapes. He had also accumulated more than 300 other items once owned by the late princess, including articles of clothing, photos, and letters to her family. But in 2002, Burl was found not guilty of the theft of Diana's possessions after the Queen herself stepped in to clarify the situation. Queen Elizabeth explained that Burl had previously asked permission to take some of Diana's personal items. Burl was subsequently acquitted of all charges in 2002. After news of the existence of Diana's tapes was made public, The Sun reported that Peter Settelin, the man who helped Diana record the videotapes in the first place, was suing in order to reclaim what he believed was rightfully his. Eventually, Diana's tapes were placed in Settelin's possession, only to be sold by him to NBC in 2004. In tapes released after her death, Diana starkly recounted her experiences with self-harm and even suicidal tendencies. She also spoke frankly about her experiences with depression, bulimia, and the stressful effects of Prince Charles's extramarital affair. Marie Claire published some of the audio transcripts from these tapes in which Diana revealed, "'We stayed up there at Balmoral from August to October. I got terribly, terribly thin. People started commenting, your bones are showing. By October, I was in a very bad way. I was so depressed, and I was trying to cut my wrists with razor blades. I came down early to London to seek treatment, not because I hated Balmoral, but because I was in such a bad way." But Diana's self-destructive behavior didn't stop there. In a Daily Mail article written by Andrew Morton, Morton references an instance of self-harm that was detailed in the Diana tapes provided to him. In those tapes, Diana said, "'When I was four months pregnant with William, I threw myself downstairs, trying to get my husband's attention for him to listen to me.'" Unfortunately, the attempt didn't phase Charles, whose reaction Diana described as, quote, "'just dismissal.'" Many people knew or heard rumors of Prince Charles' infidelities while he was married to Diana, but prior to her death, not as many members of the public knew about the princess's numerous affairs. Ken Worf, Princess Diana's chief bodyguard, wrote of Diana's affair with cavalry officer James Hewitt in his 2002 memoir, Diana Closely Guarded Secret. The pair met at a party in 1986, and according to Worf's memoir, it was clear from the way she spoke that she adored the man even after the affair had cooled. But the affair didn't heat up until after Prince Harry's birth. Diana and Hewitt would sneak off to her mother's countryside home in Devon, and with Worf's main responsibility being the protection of Diana, he went along as well. The affair, which Diana later acknowledged in her groundbreaking Panorama interview, went on for five years. But according to Worf, the romance ended with Hewitt being stationed far away in Germany, a decision that Worf says was made due to the, quote, "...emotional pressures placed on him by Diana." In other words, the princess's lover reached a point where he had had enough of this once-in-a-lifetime affair. Barry Manneke was a bodyguard and alleged lover of Princess Diana. Curiously enough, in the spring of 1987, Manneke was killed during a motorcycle accident after being thrown off the back on his colleague's bike. In the tapes recorded by Peter Settelin, Diana spoke coyly of Manneke, saying she was, quote, only happy when he was around. When I was 20, 
25. I felt deeply in love with somebody who worked in this environment. And he was the greatest friend I've ever had. Also via the tapes, Diana voiced her suspicions surrounding Manakee's death, saying she believed he was purposely killed off so the royal family could save face regarding their inappropriate relationship. Manakee's death was found to be caused by an inexperienced driver who had only been licensed to drive mere weeks before the accident occurred. But according to Andrew Morton, Diana could never quite bring herself to believe the official story. Whilst the logic of it was there, and whilst the evidence was there, um, she never really believed that. In her book, The Power of Positive Drinking, comedian Cleo Roccos describes an unusual bunch of friends, Princess Diana, Freddie Mercury, British comedian Kenny Everett, and Cleo herself. The hangout that Roccos described in her book was one filled with a viewing of the Golden Girls, champagne, and a plan to hit up a South London gay bar. But none of that would have happened had we not had a few fabulous cocktails inside us. Rocco's recounted, Freddie told her that we were going to the Vauxhall Tavern, a rather notorious gay bar in London. Diana said that she had never heard of it and she'd like to come too. In order to avoid potential tabloid drama, the group disguised Diana as a man, allowing her to effortlessly sneak into the bar and enjoy an undercover night out. And thanks to Mercury's overwhelming popularity at the time, she did. As the comedian described, she just wanted the thrill of going in undetected to order one drink and would then leave right away. She wore the outfit Kenny had intended to wear, a camouflage army jacket, hair tucked up into a leather cap, and dark aviator sunglasses. They were royals, but underneath it all, Princess Diana and sons William and Harry were a regular family just like any other. Former royal staffers have made it clear Diana wanted her boys to have as normal an upbringing as possible, even while growing up in a literal palace. William and Harry had royal chefs and nannies at their beck and call, but Diana was a famously hands-on parent. In particular, as her former butler, Paul Burrell revealed, Saturday nights were their special time together. As he recalled, quote, "...the three of them would nip to McDonald's for a Big Mac and fries before coming back to watch Blind Date." that being the classic British dating show hosted by the legendary Scylla Black. The family's penchant for McDonald's is well documented, with former palace chef Darren McGrady previously telling Marie Claire that Diana once told him to cancel lunch so they could hit up the fast food institution instead. McGrady offered to cook them burgers and fries himself, but Diana clarified the boys were after some Happy Meals so they could get the toys, too. Princess Diana's romantic relationships were consistently tabloid fodder, but according to one royal expert, the real love of her life may have been someone you've never heard of. Emma Cooper, the executive producer of CNN's docuseries Diana, told Us Weekly in 2021 that Diana was actually head over heels for a heart surgeon named Dr. Hasnot Khan, whom she'd met in a London hospital, but she knew they could never be together. The two reportedly shared an extraordinary long relationship, and the Princess of Wales was at one point even ready to marry him. Sadly, such a union wasn't possible partly because they came from two completely different worlds. As Cooper explained, marrying somebody like Diana comes at a price, and Khan, a respected doctor, couldn't risk losing his status in the community to be with her. As a result, he broke Diana's heart, which ultimately led her to initiate a relationship with film producer Dodi Fayed. Fayed was the wealthy son of billionaire Mohammed Al Fayed, who owned the luxury department store Harrods. As a result of his privileged upbringing and life as a Hollywood film producer, he was much more suited to the limelight that comes with being rich and famous than many of Diana's other lovers were. Unfortunately, their romantic relationship would end tragically the same year that it started, when they both passed away on one fateful night in Paris. In an interview with The Sun, firefighter Xavier Gormelin revealed what it was like to spend the last moments of Diana's life with her as she suffered fatal injuries in a car accident on August 31, 1997. Speaking in 2017, he recalled, "...the car was in a mess and we just dealt with it like any road accident. We got straight to work to see who needed help and who was alive." According to Gormelin, the princess was initially breathing but suffered cardiac arrest. He described her reaction as she was initially removed from the wreckage. I held her hand and told her to be calm and keep still. I said I was there to help and reassured her. She said, my God, what's happened? Within hours, the princess had died from complications of internal bleeding. Diana's lover, Dodi Fayed, and driver, Henri Paul, also perished in the crash, with the sole survivor being bodyguard Trevor Reese Jones. Gourmelin told The Sun, To be honest, I thought she would live, but I found out later she had died in hospital. It was very upsetting. In the years since Princess Diana's death, we've heard repeatedly from many sources that she wasn't quite the woman that the public thought they knew. 
And that doesn't mean that behind her public kindness and charitable acts that she was actually a bad person. On the contrary, it appears that the beleaguered royal was much stronger and more competent than many of her critics at the time appreciated. In an archival clip featured as part of 2021 CNN docuseries Diana, the princess and her new husband, Prince Charles, take part in a cringeworthy interview during which they unconvincingly discuss their hopes for their future together. In particular, she sarcastically makes a quip about being a good wife, joking that she couldn't be honest with Charles sitting right next to her. As Angela Rippon, who conducted the interview back in the day alongside Andrew Gardner, reasoned in a follow-up chat, that small moment was one of the many instances in Diana's life in which she showed the kind of person that she really was, tougher than expected and not one to conform. She recalled, There was something more to Diana, something that was not the marshmallow or the Play-Doh that was going to be molded into what they wanted. Underneath it all was Diana's unbreakable sense of self, which would ultimately lead to her divorce from Charles. In breaking from the mold of what a royal wife was expected to be, she set a new standard for the royal family, establishing herself as a unique and modern figure who still fascinates us to this day. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more list videos about the royal family are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.